Hi, welcome to High Point Online. My name is Matt. And I'm KP. And it's so nice to have you, whether you're new or returning. Happy Mother's Day happy as Mother's Day. well. If my mother's watching uh, all the way from Syracuse, New York, happy Mother's Day, Mom. Uh, but I feel like a lot of us have um, different traditions for Mother's Day. Do you, do you have one, KP, whether you're your mom by any chance? We don't have a tradition. Well, okay. I guess a tradition would be we give her gifts. So <laughs> that, that's a that'll tradition. That'll do it. That'll do it. She never asks. She always says, don't give me anything. But I'm like, I would be not the best daughter if I didn't give you at least something. <laughs> so I know some mothers, they don't like to be bothered on Mother's Day. Oh That's their gosh. Mother's Day. So, you know, whatever you like. Yeah. What about you? Um, I always just write my mom a card, like, ever since I was a kid. Like, I take, because, you know, you're a kid, and your dad goes, hey, it's Mother's Day today. You better do something. And so I would be like, oh, shoot, I got to do something for my mom. And so I'd always take, like, a, just a loose leaf sheet of paper and write a whole letter on it. But I do that every time now because I've done Aww. it since I was probably five years old. That's sweet. Yeah, I, I enjoy it. Nice. Nice, nice, very nice. Well, yes, please enjoy your day, mamas everywhere. We're going to go ahead and open up into prayer now. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day that we get to celebrate moms everywhere. Um, God, may they feel special, may they feel loved, may they feel wanted. I ask that you speak through Pastor Andy today and the worship team. God, just lead them and guide them and teach us about the formation of your church, dear Lord, and uh, bless us to be able to serve one another and love one another and grow together. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Lord, we praise you in this place, God. You are always with us, Lord. You are faithful in every season, God, and you have never left our side. Though we worship you, God. You know me by name. You called me. You called me.
Father, we thank you for this time of worship. Lord, it is always such a joy to worship you together online when we have the opportunity to be in person. Lord, it's just a thrill to be your church. Use us today. Uh, move in our lives and our hearts today and help us to become more like you in all that we do and all that we are. We love you. Amen. Great to be with you this morning. My name is Andy. I'm the lead pastor here at High Point. Uh, we are coming to you uh, from Depot Park in downtown Kennesaw today. It's also Mother's Day. You've already heard it if you caught it at the beginning of service, but happy Mother's Day to you and Happy Mother's Day to my mom, who just might be uh, watching today from Columbia, Tennessee. Shout out to you. Uh, guys, here's what we want to do. We're going to continue our time of worship. We're going to get into the message here in just a moment. Text HP Info to 97000. Uh, and that's going to get you all the information that you need about High Point. If you're watching online, especially if this is your first time, uh, we love that you're here. But that's going to give you the info that you need to get connected, to get a little bit more information about the church. Here's the other thing that it does. At our church, we believe in giving. This is a part of who we are. It's what we do. And uh, I am I'm charging us. I'm encouraging us. And I'm telling you, we have a lot of needs as a church. You'll hear about some of those here in just a moment as well. Um, and I want to invite you to give today. Give generously. Give sacrificially. Give more than you normally do. Make it an act of worship. Let's give. Let's tithe. Let's share all that we have and let's see our church uh, become uh, all that God would have it be here in uh, Kennesaw, Marietta, Woodstock, Ackworth, and the Atlanta area. Father, be with us today. Lord, bless this time of worship, uh, the, this time of offering and giving, and I pray that the message today would speak to our hearts. Amen. Amen. Here's what I want you to do. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts today. Uh, we're in a series called Brick by Brick. Here's my question to get us going today. What are you currently praying for? How are you using your faith? What in your life requires your faith? Here, here's what I mean. Let me, let me take it a, a bit further. For, for many of you, maybe you grew up uh, going to church. And so the idea of using your faith, it almost feels foreign to you because you've just grown up existing in a Christian culture, at least to some degree. And so maybe you get up and you go to church or you went to church or maybe you did the whole Wednesday night, Sunday night, Sunday morning. That was me, right? Uh, and so you just kind of are immersed in it. Um, you have a Christian community that you're a part of, but the idea that you would be praying fervently, earnestly for God to do something, you know, that you'd be believing for God to shake something and, and shape it and change it and that you desperately needed him to. These are things many times Christians can be almost, it can feel foreign experiencing that. And the idea of using your faith, for some of you, you're not using it for anything. You just simply are. And here's what I want to, to talk about today. This idea of, of, of having dangerous prayers. We, we're talking about building brick by brick in the church, which is you, by the way. The church is not just some building or something. It's the people of God, you, me, together. The foundational blocks, we talked the first week about being filled with the power of the Spirit to be God's witness. That, you, that there is a purpose to the power that He's given you. Last week we talked about just daily prayer and, and pursuing Him in a regular just habitude of living. Today though, I want to talk about something that's very unique to the early church that we see in the book of Acts. And that is praying dangerous prayers. Let's get into it in Acts chapter 4. Now, what you may not know as we, as I, before I read it, we've got Peter and John, and they're walking to the temple for prayer because prayer is central to and foundational to uh, the life of the early church. So they're on their way to prayer, and there's a man who's been crippled there for 40 years. He's looking for handouts. He's looking for help. And Peter and John don't have anything to actually give him, except they say to him, look, we'll pray for you. And they pray in the name of Jesus for him to be healed. And this man who's been crippled for 40 years is healed. The crowd comes running. People are glorifying God. The word gets out and the teachers of the law, the religious leaders of the law, they want to know what's going on. And so rather than really just being overjoyed that this man is healed, they're bothered and upset and jealous 
that ministry is being done in the name of Jesus. That's the issue here. And so they threaten Peter and John. They warn uh, Peter and John. They, 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 you know, they, they, they puff out their chest. They do all the things, right, to try to scare them into not ministering in the name of Jesus in order to be quiet, to hush this thing up. And so here we are in Acts chapter 4, verse 29. Peter and John get back together with the church. And this is what they pray. Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God boldly. Verse 32 Right after this, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. I love that. Here's the progression that we see. We see, uh, we see a bit of persecution taking place, but as soon as they get back together, the church begins to pray. They prayed. Point number one. Number two, they're filled with the Spirit. Number three, they're filled with boldness. They become bold. They preach, and then they share everything that they have. This is the progression we continue to see in the early church time and time and time again. They pray. They're filled with the Spirit. They are bold. They preach and they share. This is what we get. And so this morning, as, we, as we're looking at, at what God would desire of us or, or what we can grow into as a church here in Kennesaw and in the Atlanta area, what kind of church has God called us to be? We're called to be the kind of church that prays and sees God shake the place up. We want to pray some dangerous prayers. Look at how they prayed. God, consider their threats and enable us to speak your word with boldness. They asked for God to give them boldness. Then they asked God to stretch out his hand and to heal and to perform signs and wonders. These are risky prayers. These are faith-filled prayers. These are dangerous prayers. And so if you want to pray, and you want God to move powerfully in our city and in our church, one of the most dangerous prayers that you can pray is simply this. Dear God, use me. Amen. God, would you use me? My life is yours. Would you stretch out your hand? And would you perform signs and wonders? And meet our needs. God, would you do this? Would you use me? That's a dangerous prayer. And God will meet you where your faith is. Three things today. What dangerous praying will produce in your life. It's what we see in the early church. We see dangerous prayers producing bold preaching. Now you don't have to preach like me. I'm not telling you that you got to come down here to Depot Park, get some cameras set up and preach into a camera, or that you got to walk down the sidewalk and just let it rip. You know, that's not what I'm saying. But at some point, there is a boldness and a courage and a faith that fills God's people. There's a knowledge of His Word where you speak truth. I'm not knocking evangelism or lifestyle evangelism. Without a life that reflects the truth of God, we never even have a chance to speak the truth of God. But many times in Western Christianity, we have resorted to simply letting the lifestyle of, of the church do all the talking. And you know what? Most people do not put their faith in Jesus because other people have been nice. And I know that can be hard to hear at times, and that's not to say statistically that no one has ever done that. 
that the, the power of your life has never won somebody over to the kingdom. But by and large, most people need to hear the gospel. Most people need to hear the truth about who Jesus is and who Jesus isn't. Most people need to hear about what it looks like to live in God's kingdom and what it doesn't look like to live in God's kingdom and what it looks like to build a life that honors God and what it does not look like to, to build a life that honors God. People have to hear the truth and a, a church that will pray for God to give them the boldness to preach the gospel is a church that God will use to give the truth to share the truth, to be the truth, and people will come to know Jesus like never before. That's a dangerous prayer. Look in Acts chapter 5. This is just one chapter after the confrontation with the leaders uh, uh, and then the religious leaders with Peter and John. Peter and the other apostles replied to the, to the religious leaders of the day, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead. Hear the gospel getting preached here. Whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. Do you hear the boldness here? Are you catching it? We are witnesses of these things. Witness again. Filled with the power of the Spirit to be His witness. We're witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey Him. I love this. Part of this is a little bit of my personality, too, if you know me well. I love that there's a little bit of confrontation here. That there's a little bit of, uh, here's the truth. What are you going to do about it? Now, this is not permission to be mean. I am not suggesting that. The Holy Spirit does not give you, there's not a spiritual gift called meanness or rude, okay? That doesn't exist. In fact, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These should be in full effect as you're sharing the gospel. But people have to hear the fact that they are living in darkness and that without Jesus, they are in despair, that they are lost without him, that their sin has eternally separated them from a wonderful, beautiful, and amazing God. People have to hear this. And it can't just be the full-time pastor who's talking about Christ. A dangerous church praying dangerous prayers puts themselves on the front line of doing work and ministry and exalting Jesus for who he is. And who is he? According to Peter and John, he is prince and he is savior. And he is the one who calls us to repentance because of our sin. He saves us and he calls us into his marvelous light. People have to hear it. I have to hear it. I continually need to hear it. This isn't just the church and the others. This is something that we've got to preach to ourselves and everybody else that has a pulse. This is the gospel. This is the fruit of dangerous prayer. It produces boldness. It produces a bold preaching in the church. One of the big ideas this morning, I, I, I kind of blew through it, but I want to make sure that it's clear because this is why we preach. The reality is that the problem, the primary problem that every human faces is sin. This is our issue. The primary problem every human faces is sin. And because that's true, and because we cannot solve this problem ourselves, we need somebody who is outside this equation to step in and do what we could not do. And so Jesus lived a perfect life as both fully God and fully human, and he took the punishment for our sin. He took it. And that is the good news. 
But we've got to be a bold people who are willing to actually share it. Amen? Dangerous prayers produce bold generosity. Look what happens in Acts chapter 4, verse 32. I already read the first portion of it. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. They made no claim to it. But they shared everything that they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that there was no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. This is bold generosity. They're selling homes. And they're giving the money to the kingdom. They're selling fields. They're selling possessions. If there's a need, they're doing whatever it takes for it to be met. Only the power of the Spirit at work in a community of people. Praying dangerous prayers. God, use us. God, stretch out your hand. See, God will move powerfully. But if you're asking Him to use you, He's going to give you opportunity to be used. Don't think for a second that it's just like this magic fairy dust that you prayed and God's just going to sprinkle it around the room. He's going to use you. And that means there may be a fight on the inside because you're going to have to let go. You're going to want to, you're going to have a field to sell. You're going to have a home to sell, to give the proceeds away that God might use it to bless his kingdom, to bless people, to bless his church. This is what happens. This is how God moves in a community. And it's foundational to the life of the early church. Tim Keller, one of the things he talks about uh, he's, a, he's a, an American theologian. He's one of my favorite people to read and listen to. And he, he said one of, the, one of the most distinctive marks that set apart the early church from everyone else was the radical sense of generosity. There was no one like it. There was no thing like it. And it represented God to an unbelieving world. I've got a great example of what this bold generosity begins to look like in the life of the church. When Amy and I lived in Orlando, Florida, you know, we, we, we moved there. We're helping start a church. We were young. We just got married. And, you know, we've got an apartment, a condo, and people are, it's packed all the time with people who don't know Jesus. This is their first time hearing the gospel. And I'd love to tell you that I know exactly how our condo got filled with so many people, but it did. Neighbors and people that lived by us and people we met at the store and people we met at church, blah, blah. Well, the reality is most of the people who were in our condo had not heard the gospel at all. They just didn't know it. And so they're hearing it for the first time. They're putting their faith in Jesus in our living room. And we've got a community pool. People are getting baptized. And it's just this amazing, beautiful picture of the power of the Spirit at work and people coming to faith in Christ. Well, one of the things that began to happen is that people who had come to faith just naturally wanted to share everything that they had. Some of that being their money, some of that being their possessions. All of a sudden, Amy and I, and hear me, it wasn't because we were, you know, dirt poor or anything like that, but we didn't have a whole lot at this point. And if they, you know, a lot of these people had jobs and they could tell. It, would, it didn't take much being in our apartment to know that we didn't have a whole lot happening. And so people would just be bringing us food, right? The people that had come to faith, all of a sudden something happened and, and they're bringing drinks, they're bringing food. I had people bringing me swim trunks. True story. <laughs> I didn't use them. I didn't need them. Okay. I didn't need half the stuff, but there was just a, there was a bold desire to be generous that happened as people were putting their faith in Christ and beginning to pray for God to use them. There is a, there is a measure of, let me sell my field and sell my home and, and give to whatever need exists. I've been on the receiving end of that. Many of you watching have also been on the receiving end of that. That is how the church works. That is what is to be, uh, to be experienced. Even in the life of our church, we have unique needs that are coming up. 
And some of those needs are people needs, and some of those needs are equipment needs and facility needs. Here we are, we, we're meeting in the, the church behind me, the white historic church. You can't obviously see it at this present juncture, but we're beginning to meet at the 1808, the renovated historic church in downtown Kennesaw. And that's presented new needs for our church. And what that's going to require is the church in boldness, right? In the kind of dangerous prayer of God, use me. Well, here is how God can use you. Yes, he can use you to preach. And yes, he can use you to give. We're going to need to get a trailer for our church. We've never needed one before. But if you've been a part of the setup process yet, it's changed. Because we can't store anything on site like we used to which means we're going to have to show up with a trailer. That's well, several thousand dollars. Or maybe you know somebody who has one, or maybe you've got one that's not being used. This is what the church looks like when it comes together in boldness and gives and is generous. This is just one of our needs. We've got a new soundboard that we're looking at. We've got another camera and another computer that we're going to need. These are just basic equipment needs in a 21st century church. We're putting together our list so that you can see and give and make a difference. And then there are the lives of people who are in need. People that are suffering, people going through a difficult time, people that are just, they just need help. This is what our giving accomplishes. It furthers the kingdom. It testifies to the goodness and greatness and generosity of the God that we serve. It was God, our Father in heaven, who did what? Gave his one and only Son to you and to me. That whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Our God is a giving God. And when we pray to be used like him, that means we're going to become radical, bold givers. Dangerous prayers produce bold preaching and dangerous prayers produce bold generosity and bold givers. This is what we become. When you ask God to use you, he's going to give you the opportunity to be used. Lastly, dangerous praying produces bold miracles. Look what happens in Acts chapter 12 verse 5. Once again, Peter, he's kept in prison, but the church, what are they doing? They're praying. The church is earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Last time I checked, that means he is locked up, okay? Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. You gotta love this. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up. And the chains fell off of Peter's wrists. Moving on down to verse 12. When this had dawned on him and he, he went to the house of Mary. So Peter escapes, he leaves. He's been freed and he goes to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Over and over again in the book of Acts, we see miracles happening that make no sense. How is it that a, that a guy, that Peter, who is guarded and chained up, all of a sudden, the prison's unlocked, the chains fall off, and he's free to go? How does something like that happen if not the, if for the church praying and asking for God to move in powerful and miraculous ways? You see, when we ask for God to use us and we ask for God to move, He's going to do it when the church comes together. There is a strength in our prayer. There is a faith in our praying. Dangerous prayers produce bold miracles. When I was a student at Lipscomb University, which is where I attended in Nashville, I was, a, I think, a senior at the time and you know, we had a campus ministry that just kind of organically started and ministry was happening and people were putting their faith in Jesus and they're experiencing the Holy Spirit and things that we can't explain uh, are beginning to take place and, and a movement hits our campus and you could call it almost like a little miniature revival and that students are getting baptized all over the place. Um, we're, we're seeing ministry happen. Worship nights are taking place. It was powerful. It grew to about 120 students at the time at a small university. This was a big deal and it made a lot of noise. 
And so I was called into a meeting with the dean of students, which didn't really feel like it was going to go very well. And so, you know, I, the, our church is praying for this meeting and, you know, friends are praying for this meeting and our student ministry is praying for this meeting because we have a feeling they're going to tell us that we can't meet on campus anymore. That we're not allowed, that we're banned, that we're barred. Don't minister, right? And put the kibosh on it. And I walk into the office of the, the dean of, of, of student life and, and we sit down and that's exactly how the, the meeting goes. We don't have permission for this. This isn't, you know, this isn't what we represent as a university. It's a private school. And because it's a private school, they have the ability to throw out and throw off any group that they want. But we'd been praying, and we'd been praying leading up to this meeting. I'd been praying in my apartment leading up to this meeting, and the church had been praying. And I'm, I, I kid you not, sitting in this meeting, this guy's six foot eight, dean of student affairs. And I felt the Holy Spirit give me words to say to the dean. I laugh about it now because at the time it probably seemed crazy. But he's telling us that we can't meet on campus. And I, I look at him and I say, I, this, this is going to sound weird. But I'm just going to tell you what I feel like the Holy Spirit wants you to, to know in this moment. That God wants to save your marriage. This guy stands up from his chair, walks over to his door, shuts it, <laughs> walks back to his chair, sits down. And he says, tell me more. I said, I don't, I don't really have much more to say except I've been praying for you, praying for our campus. And this is what I sense God saying in this moment. And he said, well, I don't know how to really explain this except for the first time in the life of my marriage, we're going through a very difficult time. And so what turned, what started off as a meeting of rebuke and being pushed off campus turned into a meeting of healing, of prayer, of ministry, and even the beginning of some reconciliation. It was a powerful, beautiful moment. And in case it sounds like I'm being braggadocious on my ability in this moment, please don't hear any of that. Hear the church praying. Hear the church, the people of God, the saints. What happens when people come together in communal prayer and they're willing to ask God to do the impossible? Guess what God does? He does the impossible. Many of you have heard of healings. Many of you have heard about God moving in, 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 in powerful ways, in ways that can't be explained. Maybe you, you have even experienced that. Well, how do those things happen? We don't always have just a really great script for it. But what I continue to see in the Bible and in the scriptures is that people who are coming together, who believe God, who believe in him, who believe in his character and his goodness and his faithfulness, and they believe in his strength and a God that can do these things. It's a God that I want to ask and believe and seek and pursue that he would actually do these things. It's not my ability, it's His. It's not my glory, it's His. It's not my kingdom, it's His. But He will use you and me to see it realized. So many of you, what you need and what you desire is actually a, a spiritual adventure, so to speak. Like a defibrillator paddle shocking you out of the complacency and apathy of just Southern culture Christianity. The kind of culture where you've just kind of grown up and it's seeped into your bloodstream. Some of you need a wake-up call and a moment where you encounter the very presence and power of God. And that begins when we get off the couch and we begin to pray together and seek God and ask Him to do what only He can do. That's the kind of God that we serve. Dangerous prayers produce bold preaching. They produce bold generosity and they produce bold miracles. This is the God that we serve. There's no one like him. There's no one like him in all the earth. What are you going to do about it? You can sit on the sidelines or you can get engaged 
and seek him with all that you've got and begin to pray and pray corporately and put aside that fear. It doesn't matter that you don't know all the words to say. It doesn't matter that, that you don't have the, the right script for all of it. It doesn't matter that, that you're going to make mistakes and you're going to step out in faith and you're going to ask God to use you and you still put your foot in your mouth and, and all the things that come along with it. But God moves in the hearts of men and women who are willing to pray dangerous prayers and step out in boldness. That's what God does. And we see it foundational in the life of the church. And it's foundational to who we are as a church. It is both who we are and who we are still becoming. Let's ask God right now, together, wherever you are, to use us in such a way. Let's pray. Father, thank you. God, we come to you with gratitude in our hearts, with thanksgiving. And we thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for the miracle of Jesus, of making a way. God, we thank you that you, uh, that you made a way. And this, despite our sin, you brought us into a relationship with you, saving relationship with you. God, there's no greater miracle than that. And today, Lord, we're asking that you would stretch out your hand upon our church, on behalf of our church, through our church. Lord, that you would do signs and wonders through our church. That you would use us in extraordinary ways in our community. That you'd use us to, have, to be bold preachers of the gospel. To be people who are boldly generous. God, to be people who are boldly believing for miracles, signs, and wonders. God, this is what we're asking. This is what we're in faith for. Use us today, oh God. Use us in the weeks to come. It's all about you. It's not about us. It's about your kingdom, not ours. It's about your glory, not ours. Let this be a moment. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. There's a lot more to be shared in this moment. I got about 15,000. Okay, that was an exaggeration. I have about five. <laughs> 15,005. I've got a, a lot more Bible here. You may see some posts and some blogs here in the days and weeks to come. Story after story, moment after moment, where God uses the church. The people of God, not the staff, not only not the super spiritual, but the people of God. And they shake up their city in the same way that God shook the room with their bold praying and their dangerous praying. He shakes up a city. He shakes up a community. Frankly, he'll shake up you. And this is what we want and this is what we need. Let's be a people that pray. Let's be a people that pray dangerously for God to use us. Thankful for you. I truly am thankful for you. I'm looking forward to worship with, worshiping with you next week. See you right here. Thank you, Pastor Andy, so much for that really great message. Hey, kids, this one's for you. We've got our summer kickoff on May 16th, where we're going to celebrate you finishing up your school year. Wow. Yay! It's going to be at Swift Cantrell Park, and you don't have to register, but your parents should for you. Just text HP Info to 97000. Absolutely. And we have our next in-person service is going to be a graduation service so if you have any kids graduating whether college high school over the past two years by the way because let's just be real the last year really didn't count so over the past two years make sure you register them and service by texting hp info to 97,000. see you there yes y'all have a wonderful week and remember treat your mamas 
Um, even if it's just a phone call, a text, um, make sure that your mothers have a wonderful Mother's Day. <laughs> have a good one, everybody. Bye. <laughs>